Prophet ﷺ said, Verily, there will come upon people a time when truthful people would be deemed liars and they would also deem liars to be truthful, that a trustworthy person would be deemed treacherous and a treacherous person would be deemed trustworthy. And the Prophet ﷺ said that a man would swear an oath, even if he had not been asked to swear an oath. And then he said that the most felicitous people or, or the people of the most joy in the world would be Luka ibn Luka, which is an Arabic idiom for the lowest of the low. And he said they would neither believe in Allah nor his prophet. And so this is an indication of a, a certain time that would come. But there's another hadith which is related, a very similar thing where the Prophet ﷺ said that Bani Adaya Sa'a Sinuna Khada'a, and in one uh, narration, Khada'at, that before the actual hour comes, you would have years of deception. And then he repeated this about that the Kha'in would be believed and treacherous people would be deemed trustworthy and truthful ones would be deemed liars. So I think it's very important that he told us that there would be years of deception. There would be a lot of deception where you, you, you would look at things and you wouldn't know what was happening. And one of the verses in the Quran that's really important, uh, the reason for it coming down was that a man came uh, to the Prophet and it was actually a man al-Walid, who, Ibn Abi Muti' who was actually one of the righteous of the Sahaba. But he told the Prophet him about some people that they had abandoned Islam without really uh, firmly establishing that fact. And so the verse that was revealed about that was, so this man who is actually not a fasiq is the cause for this ayah to be revealed. And the reason the commentators say is because if you transmit things without ascertaining whether they're true or not, it's an act of fisk. It's an act of profligacy, of putting you outside of the pale of what's accepted with Allah and his messenger. And so the Prophet ﷺ also said that it's enough to deem a person a liar who repeats everything he hears. Now, one of the things about uh, the time we're living in is rumors just circulate so fast. In fact, uh, according uh, to experts, apparently, and we have to take all this with a grain of salt to be consistent with what I'm talking about, false uh, news spread six times faster than actually news that's true. But I would argue that most news by the criteria that we were given to judge whether something was true or false, nothing that we read can be taken at face value. We have to really consider everything we read to be potentially false. I mean, that's, that's by using our standards because we have extremely high standards, especially when they deal with a person's honor, their ird. And one of the things that the Prophet ﷺ said about the latter days, he said that you're living in a time that people are like fruitful trees, but there's coming a time when they'll be like thorny bushes. They'll be like trees with thorns. And he said that, If you speak to them, they'll speak to you. And if you turn away from them, they won't leave you alone. And if, if you try to avoid them, they will seek you out. And then one of the Sahaba said, what do you tell us to do in those days? And he said, Loan them your good name for the day when you'll need to take that loan back. In other words, just let them slander you and let them say what they're going to say about you and just Consider it a loan to them and you'll get their hasanat on the day of judgment when you need it. So he was actually telling us that there's going to be a time when people will just say things and, and they won't leave you alone. They'll just seek you out and hunt you out. And there's a lot of this is online because people now, they just talk about other people. And it's as if when you go online, all for Muslims, I mean, I have to believe a, a lot of the comments must it, that have Muslim names must be from people outside of our religion, because I can't believe Muslims would write some of the things that they write on these things. We have to just assume that these are actually people trying to make Muslims look bad, because it's hard to believe that Muslims could actually do these things. And so people just seem to, when they go online, feel like they can say whatever they want, 
and not have any repercussions. But there's actually a day of judgment and everything you say is being recorded, literally. And subhanAllah, I mean, I'm right now talking into a recorder. So the Quran says we will show them our signs. And the whole thing, I can't, there's things on YouTube I, I wish I could take down, but I can't. Because it's just there in what they call the data sphere, the noosphere. There's nothing we can do about that. Well, that's your whole life. And on the day of judgment, you're going to have to see. In fact, there's something called the ard in our tradition, which is where you have to watch your whole life. Now, fortunately, like you have in dunya, you have something called editing machine in which you can edit out things. And toba is one way of editing your life. Uh, so if you really make a sincere toba, it's like you can cut out that part of the film that you're going to have to watch in the afterlife. One of the interesting things about the afterlife is that believers that are in a good state with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala get private screenings, whereas the other people have to, everybody watches it. That's why it's so long. It just goes on and on and on the day of judgment because everybody has to see all these things. And that's why traditionally the Muslims used to say, Ya Satr, O Veiler of things, you know, to veil us. So these verses that were revealed in the Quran about this event that took place are, Ya yuhalladina amanu in ja'akum fasiqum binab'in fatabayyanu. If people come with news, then tabayyanu, clarify it. And there's another qira'a, which is tathabatu, because they're written the same way, but this is a different qira'a, it's a sound recension. And what that means, tabayyanu and tathabatu, Tabayun is to make sure that you know what's being said, because sometimes we misinterpret words. Tathabatu is make sure that it actually happened. In all news, we have to make sure because we know fake news happens. And we know even news casters have to retract what they say sometimes. Or they, but very often, nobody knows about the retraction because it's put the next day or something. And, and so... A lot of people are harmed, and that's why Allah says, Because you might actually harm some people out of ignorance on spreading this news, and then you'll be feel remorseful about it. Better to be remorseful here than on the Day of Judgment, but there's going to be a lot of people with great remorse on the Day of Judgment. And then, وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ Know that the Messenger of Allah is among you. His sunnah is amongst us. I mean, we should be reminded of his sunnah because the Prophet Sallallahu You know, I left you two things. If you hold to them, you will never go astray. Kitab Allah wa itarati, Kitab Allah wa sunnati. There's two riwayah of that. The book of Allah and my family and the book of Allah and my sunnah. And both are from the Sunni tradition. So, these are sacred trusts that the Prophet ﷺ left. There's an amazing hadith, which is Sahih, where the Prophet ﷺ said that بَدَأْ إِسْلَامُ غَرِيبًا وَسَيْعُودُ كَمَا بَدَأَ غَرِيبًا فَطُوبَ لِلْغُرَبَى That Islam began a strange affair, and it will return a strange affair. So blessed are the strangers. Tuba, they say, is a tree in paradise that uh, the righteous sit under. But it also just has the idea of blessed. So blessed are the strangers. And then they asked him who those ghuraba were. Who are the strangers? He said, they are the people that rectify my sunnah after the people have corrupted it. So these are the people that actually rectify the sunnah of the Prophet in times when his sunnah, his way is being corrupted. I think it should be very clear to a lot of us, if not all of us, that the sunnah of the Prophet has been corrupted by our community because we don't practice these things anymore. Whoever believes in Allah on the last day, let him speak good or be silent. Let him speak good or be silent. Say good things. We have a problem of like these critics that want to just everything everybody does, they will just jump on it. And one of the things, and I've tried, I mean, I've been a public figure for many, many years. I've really tried to avoid that my whole public career, just because I thought that was sunnah, like to practice that. That was my understanding. Like you can talk about ideas. It's important if there's bad ideas out there, you should criticize ideas. But attacking people. Now, one of the things Imam al-Ghazali says in Kitab al-Ilm, which is the first book 
of the Ihya, which is the revivification or the revival of the Islamic sciences, he begins it with the book of knowledge because that's how Islamic sciences are revived. In that book, he says, he calls these people the foul scholars, ulama asu. And he said the hallmark of foul scholars is they attack other scholars. He said that is their hallmark. And he said they always do it claiming that they're defending the religion. They're doing it out of righteousness. And يَذُبُّونَ عَنِ الْحَقِّ They're defending the religion. But then he says, in reality, they're undermining the religion. He goes into the psychology behind it. And he says the actual reason why they're doing it is because they know that the quickest way to gain followers is by attacking others. And... This is a psychology. And so one of the things that you will note is that some people, they're on, for instance, they have a channel or something online and their normal talks will have very low viewing. So like a few hundred people. But then when they attack a scholar and they put the name of the scholar, why you shouldn't follow so-and-so or why so-and-so is misguided, they'll have thousands of people going on to it. So they know that it works. And that's what Imam al-Ghazali says. This is a strategy for gaining followers. And he says at ba in Kitab al-Ilm, which is now in online, they call them followers, like how many followers you have. And followers means nothing. It doesn't mean you're guided because you have lots of followers. It could be quite the opposite. I mean, there's celebrities that have millions of followers. And then there's incredible scholars that like have a handful. Allah does that. That's not within our grasp. So it's important to note. And Imam al-Ghazali then says something very interesting. He says, and somebody might say that I'm, I don't know what I'm talking about. He said, no, take it from one who was the best of the bunch at doing that before Allah illuminated his inner eye and he made tawbah. And he's talking about himself because he was famous for that, for attacking other people. And he could win any argument, but he realized that he was misguided in doing it. And one of the things that Sheikh Uthaymain, who was one of the great scholars of Arabia, died not that long ago. But one of the things that he said was there are three reasons why scholars should not attack other scholars. The first reason is that when you attack other scholars, the people that support those scholars will never listen to you because they just don't like you for attacking the scholar that they like. So you lose credibility with a lot of people that you shouldn't lose credibility with. That's one reason. The second reason, he says, it undermines scholarship because... If you're attacking scholars, instead of saying like, I think this position might be wrong and, or there might be a khilaf or something, instead of looking at, or like he says that you should actually contact them and ask them about why they've said something, because maybe they didn't even say it. But the third thing he said is that it creates doubt in the common people. They lose their faith in scholars. And so it undermines the sharia. So those are three reasons, but I think the best reason is because the Prophet ﷺ said that when Allah removes his providential care on people, the sign of it is that he preoccupies them with things that don't concern them. And that's another really important hadith because the Prophet ﷺ said in a hadith that Abu Huraira relates, he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Min husni Islam al Mar'i Tarkuhu Mala Yaanihi. And this is a good hadith that Imam al-Tirmidhi relates, one of the six canonical books as the Sunan of Imam al-Tirmidhi. So this hadith says that from the beautiful Islam of a person is his leaving what doesn't concern him. In other words, minding his own business. And one of the hallmarks of what in English we call busybodies is people that concern themselves with things that aren't their concern. One of the scholars was walking by a beautiful house and he asked somebody whose house it was and he told him. And the scholar said that he asked forgiveness for Allah for 40 days after that because he said it was none of his business whose house it was. <laughs> it was just, it's still lot like curiosity, which didn't just kill the cat. It very often will kill your heart. And so... In this hadith, which Abu Dawud said is one-fourth of Islam. One-fourth of Islam. In this hadith, Ibn Hajar al-Haytami, in his amazing commentary, 
he said he did a commentary on the 40 hadith of Imam an which is he put it in there. But Abu Dawud said this is one fourth of Islam. Ibn Hajar said, Al Haytami, not Asqalani. He said, actually, this is half of Islam. Because half of Islam is fi'l and the other half is tark. Half of it is doing and the other half is not doing. So this is the half that deals with doing. And then he said, no, I'll even go further than that. I'll say this is all of Islam. It's not even a fourth or a half. It is all of Islam. Because if you're not preoccupied in what doesn't concern you, that means you're preoccupied in what concern you. And so he said the min here is not partitive because the min this is a little for the grammarians out there that people have interest in grammar. Min has 12 meanings in Arabic. The min comes for tabiin. It comes to clarify something. It comes as a partitive. It comes for what's called ta'lil, which is for giving the reason why. Like ashtaki min and marad. I'm complaining of a disease. So it's the ta'lil. It's the reason. And then the min of beginning, like I came from Mecca. The min of ending the min of ibdal or a replacement min or the min of za'ida or the min of fasl which separates things and then it can also mean fi which is like in and an and ala and ba it can be used as a ba so those are the 12 meanings so in any hadith that uses min the the scholar has to discern which one of those the same in the eyes of the quran so grammar matters and one of the hallmarks of our time, not just in Arabic, but in English as well, is that we've lost grammar. And people should be more concerned about learning grammar because what I've noted in all the comments I've ever read on internet, I've noted that all the really bad ones were written with bad grammar. And when they're written well, I've noticed that usually they say intelligent things, which is very interesting. And that's not elitist. That's just education, which is the hallmark of our religion. The Prophet Sallallahu said, seeking knowledge is incumbent upon every Muslim man and woman. So we're people of literacy. Iqra, bismi rabbika ladhi kharaq. We are people of literacy. So I just want to uh, really warn everybody because there's a great statement of Imam al-Ghazali mentions Abu Qasim al-Hakim al-Samarqandi, who was one of the great scholars of Central Asia. He was from Samarqand. And he said, all of the world's tribulations come from three things. All of them. He said the first is a naqal al-akhbar. I would translate as a newscaster, somebody who's transmitting news. And then the second he said is mutalaqi al-akhbar, which is a consumer, a news consumer, somebody who's consuming news. And the third one he said is talib al-akhbar, a news hound. And he said none of them are free of blame. So all of the world's tribulations come from these three things. And so... I want to just close this with something that from a great philosopher who over 200 years ago saw what was happening with the media. Because news, believe it or not, we've always had news, but newspapers and what we call modern media are actually relatively new things. And so this philosopher said that it says daily press, but I'm going to slightly change some of the wording to make it relevant for us today because it was said over 200 years ago. He said that media is the evil principle of the modern world and time will only serve to disclose this fact with greater and greater clarity. The capacity of the media for degeneration is sophistically without limit since it can always seek lower and lower in its choice of consumers. At last, it will stir up all the dregs of humanity which no state or government can control. And then he said... Suppose someone invented an instrument, a convenient little talking tube. I'm not making this up over 200 years ago. Suppose someone invented an instrument, a convenient little talking tube, which say could be heard over the whole world. I wonder if the police would not forbid it, fearing that the whole country would become mentally deranged if it were used. On the whole, the evil in the media consists in its being calculated to make, if possible, the passing moment a thousand or ten thousand times more inflated and important than it really is. But all moral elevation consists first and foremost in being weaned from the momentary. I mean, think about this. What does Allah say? <laughs> what are they asking about? al <laughs> Azim. On the vast news, the day of judgment, that's the real news. 
that we are going to be taken to account for our lives, for everything we do. And that's the real news. And once you realize that news, once that text message comes to you, if you really take it seriously, you'll start preparing and really think about it. So if you actually look at the name of our Prophet Sallallahu he is a Nabi. What is a Nabi? There's two ways of saying that, Nabiyun and Nabiun, with Hamza or with the Ya. With the Hamza, it's from Naba'a, news. So the prophets are the news bringers. They bring the news. And the news is either glad tidings, if you believe, or it's a warning if you don't believe. That's the real news. That's the news that we should be tuned into. It's not CNN. It's not MSNBC. It's not Fox News. It's divine news because that's the real news. And then he says, and I'm going to substitute because he was Christian. I'm going to substitute Islam for Christianity here. If Christianity is really to be proclaimed, I would say if Islam is really to be proclaimed, it will become apparent that the media which will, if possible, make it impossible. There has never been a power so diametrically opposed to Islam as the media. Day in and day out, the media does nothing but delude the masses with the supreme axiom of this lie, that numbers are decisive. Islam, on the other hand, is based on the thought that the truth lies in the single individual. Because you're all going to be raised up as individuals. Each one of us is going to be called by our name and our mother's name. Every single one of us. We are not judged collectively. We're judged as individuals. And this whole collectivization that's happened in the modern era, where everybody talks about groups as if there's some real group out there called this people or that people. Where? Where are they? There's only individuals. That's all there is. And that's, in the end, how we're going to be raised up as individuals. On that note, I will say, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, forgive me if I've said anything wrong, uh, bless all of you. Inshallah, may we take these things to heart and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, elevate us and free us of the, the worst tendencies of ourselves. Inshallah. Barakallah fikum. Wassalamu alaikum. Warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.